Thank you, Steve. And, uh, it's great to be back uh, and uh, worshipping with everyone again today. It was great to be able to join by FaceTime last week, uh, even though we couldn't physically be here. It's just uh, so wonderful the, uh, the ways in which we can uh, still be part of something nowadays, uh, even though we're, we're somewhere else. So if, anyway, Happy New Year to you all. Thank you. You too. Good to see you again. Uh, I don't know, it's quite a long time, I would think, since most of us here were at school. <laughs> I know, that I said most of us, because I was aware that Matthew is still at school. Uh, but for most of us, I think it's quite a long time. Um, and I know in the, in the British school system, uh, when it came to exams or essays, then quite a, a common thing that you would have to do is to look at two passages in English. I don't know if they do this in France or not with French yet. Look at two passages in, in, in your language and the, the, uh, the question is, compare and contrast these passages. And you have to go through them and you have to pick out the things that are similar or the same within them. And the, the things that are completely different in them. Well, that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to compare and contrast two passages of scripture. Uh, not as an academic exercise, because, you know, um, living as a Christian is not an academic exercise. It's about reality. It's about life. It's about living in the presence and power of God. Um, but uh, there are two very different concepts set forth in these scriptures that we're going to look at today. So if we could have the Ecclesiastes passage up. First, that would be great. Okay, good. So if, uh, if someone would like to read that for us in English first, please. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. I was here already long ago. It was here before our time. Thank you. And someone would like to read it in French, Nikki, thank you. Parole de l'Ecclesiaste, fils de David, roi à Jérusalem. Comble de la consistance, dit l'Ecclesiaste. Comble de la consistance, tout n'est que fumé. Ce qui a existé, c'est ce qui existera, et ce qui s'est fait, c'est ce qui se fera. Il n'y a rien de nouveau sous le soleil. Si l'on dit à propos de quelque chose, regarde ceci, c'est nouveau, en réalité, cela existait déjà dans les siècles précédents. Thank you. These words, it tells us at the beginning, they're the words of the preacher. Um, the son of David, or the teacher, depending on the, the version you have, the son of David, it's uh, reckoned that it's Solomon, uh, the son of David, who wrote this book. Um, and it's really a digest of some of his wisdom. Um, Solomon was reckoned to be the wisest man who ever lived. Um, and this is the conclusion, if you like, that he came to through his wisdom. And basically, uh, the, the, the conclusion is there's nothing new under the sun. That's it. Um, and if you go through, if you just concentrate it on Ecclesiastes as your sort of source of life and purpose, then it's pretty dire and pretty drastic because he's looking at life and, and you know, we, we think, well, this is scripture, so it's a word of God, so it, it must be true. Uh, and, uh, and things can be true without being upbuilding, if you like, or without uh, giving us a foundation 
for living our lives. Um, and uh, this is, I would suggest, some, well, we're going to look at it a bit more in a minute, but this is something that gets to the heart of how things are in this world, but yet uh, without giving us that little extra that gives us hope for living in the world as it is. So now, if we move on to Revelation chapter 21, last book in the Bible. And again, if somebody could read it for us in French first this time. Un nouveau ciel et une nouvelle terre, puis je vis un nouveau ciel et une nouvelle terre. Car le premier ciel et la première terre avaient disparu et la mer n'existait plus. Je vis descendre du ciel d'auprès de Dieu la ville sainte, la nouvelle Jérusalem, prépare comme une mariée qui s'est fait belle pour son époux. J'entends une voix forte venant du ciel qui disait « Voici le tabernacle » de Dieu parmi les hommes, il habitera avec eux, ils seront son peuple, et Dieu lui-même sera avec eux, il sera leur Dieu, il suivra toute l'âme de leurs yeux, la mort ne sera plus, et il n'y aura plus ni deuil, ni cri, ni douleur, car ce qui n'existait avant, qui existait avant, a disparu. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, someone read it for us in English, please. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. But the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bridge, bright, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Continue in English, someone. He, was seated, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost, we will sprinkle the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second day. Thank you, John. And, uh in French, en français, s'il vous plaît. Celui qui est assis sur le trône dit, voici, je fais toutes choses nouvelles. Il ajoute d'or, écrit cela, car ses paroles sont dignes de confiance et vraies. Puis il me dit, je suis l'alpha et l'oméga, le commencement et la fin. Et celui qui a soif, je donnerai à boire gratuitement de la source, de, de la source de l'eau de Merci. Okay, so compare and contrast these two passages. Uh, at the heart of the first passage, we've got the statement from the preacher, nothing is new. 
Everything just goes on and on and on in the same old way. Same old, same old. And as we look around us at the world, I think we can probably agree with that. That uh, for all the, the claims of human progress and advance and everything, the world's still in a mess. And the same old problems still keep coming up and don't seem to find any answers. Nothing is new. It's all as it always was. Um, new Year's a time when we make resolutions, don't we? Anyone here made some New Year resolutions? They're all too wise for that. <laughs> <coughs> but I, I, read, uh, I read this morning in, in, in a passage I was, I was looking at that um, only 20% of Americans who make New Year resolutions actually keep them. That's not a big proportion. It's actually higher than I thought it would be. But um, <laughs> there we go. Um, but that's America, of course, so maybe they, they do things better there. Um, so nothing's new. And yet, at the heart of the second passage, we have the Lord saying, I am making everything new. Or I make everything new. We can have the, the two uh, readings of that. And so, which do you want to build your life on? Do you want to build your life on the fact that nothing ever changes? That nothing ever gets better? That it's just same old, same old, year in, year out, and there's nothing much we can do about it? Or would you like to build your life on the promise of God? That I am making all things new. So in comparing and contrasting these two statements, I want to look first of all at false hopes. Because as we uh, listen to the media, as we look at the world around us, as we meet people and chat with them and so on, we come across a number of false hopes that drive people and enable them to uh, progress or not in their lives. And the first of these is one that has been the, the basis of our civilization and of our society's thinking for generations now. It's this idea of human upward progression. You know, that we're always getting better as human beings. It flows out of the, the, the concept of evolution. Um, and evolution, by the way, is not a scientific theory, it's a philosophy and is um, subject to all the flaws of, of human philosophy. We'll not go down that road just now. Um, this idea of the ever-improving world is then taken over into um, the, the way in which we live, the, way that, the things that we build our lives on, and there's this idea of human upward progression. We're getting morally better and better all the time. We're getting physically better and better and stronger and stronger. And we're getting spiritually better and better all the time. You see it in the sort of, um, you know, have you ever come across uh, the, the statement, oh, uh, about something bad? Uh, this, is, this shouldn't be happening in 2023. Yeah. <coughs> Why uh, should 2023 be any different from 2022 or 1922 or 202? This idea, we're getting better all the time. But are we? Look at the world around us. I don't think that holds water. Wars, oppression, exploitation, <coughs> disease, crime, all these things continue and abound in our culture, in our society, in our world as a whole. And really, when it comes down to it, it's, uh, it's down to, the, the cause of it is down to flawed humanity. We are not improving morally, physically, physically perhaps to an extent, but death still comes to us all. <coughs> We're not improving spiritually. 
And if we're going to base our hope on human uh, upward progression, then we've got a hopeless future because everything is just the same as it was. There's nothing new. You know, in, in, um, in, in our, our culture just now, certain, there's a number of laws and practices and behaviors being promoted and introduced as something new, that this is uh, our new tolerant society. But actually, if you go back and look at the downfall of previous civilizations, you find that these new things, this new tolerance, was actually the herald of the, the collapse of these civilizations in the past. And rather than it's something new and something hopeful, this is something to be feared, perhaps, or to at least um, to be regarded as, as unhelpful. Okay, so we've got this false hope of upward progression as human beings that we're improving all the time and it, it doesn't work. Then if we, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if we look further, you've got this idea current in so many religions of reincarnation. You know, we, we uh, live this life um, as human beings and uh, we, we do what we do and uh, then at the end of this life we depart for a while and then we reincarnate we're born again into a different life and depending on how we lived in the first life um, or it might actually be the thousand and first life because we've probably been there before but depending on how we've done in that life then it depends how we come back so if we've um, not been very good, then maybe we come back as a slug. <laughs> or uh, a microbe. Or something easily snuffed out. And I suppose um, as, as, if you come back as a slug, then um, it's difficult to make a real mess of being a slug. And so... If once you die as a slug, you're going to come back as something better. So that's hopeful. But, of course, then you've got to do better in the, in the better life that you've got. You've got to do better with that and so on. And it ends up as round in circles we go. There's no real hope, no real progression. And as we don't have a consciousness of the past life that we've had, uh, and we won't have a consciousness of this life and the next one that we have... It's really of no help whatsoever. And in that thinking, there is, there's no hope, there's no assurance. The ultimate hope is just oblivion. Um, and the end of us as self-aware personalities. And I don't think that really gives an answer to the, the big human questions. Why am I here? Who am I? What am I doing? But then you, get across, you come across the self-help movement. You know, it's maybe summed up in, the, in Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. There was a, a movement in the, certainly in Britain and in the States back in uh, uh, about 50 years ago called Moral Rearmament. I don't know if any of you came across it, but the whole idea of moral rearmament was I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can do it by myself. I can improve my life. Yeah. Ah. Are you okay? our translation okay all right now that's great so the the idea of moral rearmament was i can improve myself i can improve my world um, it's not surprising that that movement didn't last very long because it was doomed to failure just by the whole um, 
business of human nature. The human nature that's summed up in Paul's statements in, in Romans 7 where he talks about his struggle with doing right and living a godly life. And uh, Apostle Paul, who you know, we would probably look up to as an example for our, our Christian lives, he says, wretched man that I am. The sin that I don't want to do is what I do. The good that I want to do, I can't do. Who will deliver me from this body of death, he says. Now that's a paraphrase. You can look it up in Romans 7 for yourselves. But to put our trust in our own abilities is a false, dead-end way. Because we don't, we're all going to fail at some point or another. Even to do, try to do it as a community. We, we get dragged down by the rivalries, the jealousies, the pride and, and all the other things, negative things that get in the way. So, <coughs> along with human upward progression, along with reincarnation, self-help is a false hope. It won't get us there. But I want to contrast that by looking at a living hope. This is a hope that is based in reality. It's based in someone who can do all things. Um, as Stephen, I didn't know Stephen was going to read that verse at the beginning of the service today um, about uh, uh, he's able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. That's Amen. our God. And that's where our hope for this life and for the future really comes from. What we get in, in Revelation 21 is a glimpse into the future. Of course, it's, it's a, a, in some ways, it's in pictorial language. It's, it's visionary. It's not uh, something uh, that we can fully comprehend or take in. It doesn't make it less true. It's expressed that way because it is so so wonderful, so much beyond our experience of this world. And it gives us something to hold on to, something to trust in. And what he's talking about here is radical transformation. It's not same old, same old. It's not, it's not there's nothing new. It is the old has passed away, the new has come. And uh, again, as we look at the current universe, it's marred by the fall, by the, the sin of, of humanity, which dragged it down. And all the negative things, uh, all the brokenness are characteristic of the, the universe that we live in, of the world that we live in. And the only way to deal with that and to set it right is a radical remake. It's starting all over again. And that's what God is promising here. Not just uh, the attempt at a, a resolution to do better, but a total transformation of the universe as a whole and of human beings in particular. If we compare what we've been looking at in, in terms of human experience in this world today, with all its difficulties, with all its brokenness, wars, oppression, exploitation, disease, crime, all the rest of it, if we look at that and then compare it with what's coming, then we have a glorious hope. The Lord says in, in verse 3, Now the dwelling of God is with men or with people. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And one of the biggest 
lacks in our world today is the presence of God. So much hurt, so much loneliness, so much pain. And it comes down to the, the lack of the presence of God in our experience. And he says, I'm coming to set that right. I'm coming to give you a knowledge of me, a knowledge of my presence, an experience of my love that will transform. It goes on and it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And behind that is not just the, the, the momentary wiping away of tears so that then more tears can flow later. But actually the healing of all the pain, all the hurt, all the rejection, everything that caused the tears in the first place. He is coming to deal with these. There will be no more death. No more mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things has passed away. He says, to him who is thirsty or to her who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And that echoes promises from elsewhere in the scriptures from Isaiah you are thirsty, come and drink. You who have no money, come by wine and milk. Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me. Drink of me and you'll be refreshed. And the, the, the picture that we're getting here is of the fulfillment of every desire, every longing, every uh, brokenness in our hearts and our lives to be found in Jesus. And of course, the picture here is of a new heavens and a new earth. It's of something beyond now, something that's coming later. But I want you to, to notice the way that he says it here. He says, I am making all things new. It's not I will make all things new. It's not just about what's coming in the future. He says, I am making all things new. I'm doing it now. And the beginning of that healing, that refreshing, that restoring is here and now in our lives, in this broken world. Jesus is for us and with us, is making things new in our lives. As I say these words, I think about Stas. Stas was a guy that I met in 2009 in um, Azbest in Russia. Okay. And a man called Stas. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I met him in 2009 in Azbest in Russia. Guess what they make in Azbest? Asbestos. It's the biggest hole in the ground you ever saw. Uh, massive, several kilometers long and a couple of kilometers wide. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Stas was an addict. When I first met Stas, the hopelessness, the desolation that was in his life just looked out from his eyes. You could see the brokenness. And he was in a, a Christian rehab center in this town. Um, and he asked if we would pray with him while we were there. Prayed with him and then we went back to Scotland. Next year we went back and there was Stas again, totally different man. The hopelessness had gone, the, there was a new purpose, a new direction to his life. He was actually beginning to train as a leader in the rehab center. And each year as we went back, we saw increasing difference in Stas <coughs> to the extent that now he heads up a, a rehab center in a different city. He is training others, he is, he's 
bringing others into an experience of Jesus as Savior. He's seeing their lives transformed just as his was transformed. He's married to a lady who was also in the rehab center at the time, that first time that we went there, and whose life has also been transformed. Jesus is making all things new in Stas's life. I think of Graham. Graham was a young guy, 18 years old, came to see a group of us in Orkney. Um, he had absolutely no hope in his life. He had come out of school with nothing. He had no motivation to live or to change. He asked us to pray for him. And today, Graham is headmaster of a school in Scotland, having tr been transformed by the power and the love of Jesus. Could go on and give lots more examples, but the thing is, for you, for me, with all the challenges that we face, with all the, the things that life throws at us, <coughs> the truth is this, Jesus is making all things new. He's working in us, he's working in each other, He's working in our church. Uh, he's making all things new. We won't see the completion of that just yet. But the, it gives us hope and confidence to progress onwards, to go on into this year. Whether we've managed to keep our new, res, new year resolutions or not. To know that Jesus is with us and for us. And he's making all things new. So the situations that have plagued us, we know he can change. And the things in our own lives that disappoint us, we know he can change. And we look to him for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are in the business of making all things new. That you're not just sitting up there in a cloud looking down at us and shaking your head. But that you have sent your son. That by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. He has the authority to make all things new. He has defeated sin and death and he is Lord. Thank you Father. Help us to allow you to make things new in our lives and through us to change the society that we live in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.